ready to keep you company wherever you are. Card Blanche, the podcast, brings you immersive, hard-hitting stories anytime, anywhere, every week. Welcome to another episode of the Whole Week Wrap with Daily Maverick and Carte Blanche. It's a finance-focused episode this week as we are joined for the first time by Daily Maverick personal finance editor, Nisa Moodley. A financial journalist for more than 20 years, Nisa is all about empowering people to better manage their money. It's another jam-packed show, so here's what's coming your way. The two-part what? With just four months before it goes live, we look at the two-part retirement system. How the local drone industry is quite literally lifting off in a big way. Then, could we face another bird flu epidemic? Why the novel H7N6 strain is cause for concern. Later, a new road safety survey calls drivers out on their bad habits. And South Africans are gutful, so they're fixing things themselves. I was fascinated by the fact that the municipality had estimated the cost of the bridge would be one and a half to 1.7 million rand, and they couldn't say when it could be done. And this community got together, and with 80,000 rand, they managed to do it in a very short space of time, which is cool. But first, President Cyril Ramaphosa found his pen and the Rolls-Royce of healthcare has been signed into law this past week. But not everyone is celebrating the National Health Insurance Bill. During a joyous signing ceremony, President Ramaphosa said the NHI is, quote, a commitment to eradicate the stark inequalities that have long determined who in the country receives adequate health care. And while the idea looks very nice on paper, some experts and organizations have called the entire process rushed and the bill unconstitutional. So, don't cancel your medical aid just yet. Now, Nisa, this is your first time with us on The Whole Week Wrap, and I'm so excited to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Luzon. Thanks so much for having me. So we have a relatively finance-heavy show today, and that is after all your focus, from personal finance to local market movements. You're keeping an eye on all of it, and I, I really don't know how, because there's so much happening in a week. And we certainly have a lot to get through today. So let's get started with the signing of the National Health Insurance Bill. It's, of course, the big headline of the past week. Some have celebrated it and others have accused President Cyril Ramaphosa and the ANC of electioneering. But I think the fact remains, NHI is now law. And I kind of want to know from you, what has been the market response following Wednesday's signing ceremony? So the market response has been varied. Like you said, there are some people who welcome it. I think the Council for Medical Schemes said They do welcome the signing of the bill. However, they're noting that there are different states when it comes to implementation. So it's not as simple as, okay, so the president signed it on Wednesday and next week you can walk into any private hospital and get free health care. It's going to be very much more nuanced than that. And National Treasury also told me that they are still finalizing funding for the NHI which hasn't been done yet and is likely going to take several years. And there's also a lot of information floating around and it's all rather confusing, I think, for a lot of people, mostly because, as you've just said, the funding hasn't been finalized. And when you read into the NHI bill, it's very vague how government plans on funding it. It leads to, I think, members of the public then freaking out a little bit because then rumors start spreading all over the place. I remember Discovery CEO Adrian Gore told MoneyWeb that medical scheme members will now essentially pay 31% more tax and receive 69% less benefits. Now, I want to know from you, because that's the one that a lot of people are running with, is that factually correct at this point, or do we not know how the funding is going to work in terms of taxation? I think that is one potential option. I don't think it's fact because it hasn't been final. So I think it would be very 
preemptive of people to think that that's definitely how it's going to happen. And I think that also what the public needs to remember, and I think medical schemes are trying to manage at the moment, is that a lot of medical scheme members are panicking and we all know how expensive medical aid is. Yes. So there's a number of people calling their schemes and saying, actually, now I want to resign because I've got an NHI and I don't need you anymore. And mm. that's really not accurate because until it becomes practical and until the president actually makes certain sections implementable, your medical schemes will still be giving you cover. I just want to kind of stick with the funding for a little bit because it's really no secret that the economy is in a dismal state. And so the big question is, where will the money come from? Government has said, OK, we're going to move some money from one department to another. But I mean, a lot of the departments are already running on shoestring budgets. So I can't imagine that there's a lot up for grabs either way. And then when you talk about increased taxation, increased VAT, with the working class already under immense pressure to make ends meet, is further taxation really the answer? Is moving budgets around the answer? Do you think government has actually thought this through? Because it does feel very rushed. It definitely feels very rushed. I can tell you that there hasn't been very much thought given to it. I think it's a very nice idea in principle, practically how it's going to work, I don't see how it's going to work unless there are tax increases, which is going to be very harsh on taxpayers who are already under quite a bit of stress. And the finance ministry has basically said that any details on tax amendments to raise resources for NHI will only be announced in a budget speech, which means we're waiting till February next year, maybe September, October, but unlikely. And then actually then going towards setting up an NHI fund and, and making it operational will also take quite some time. I read somewhere that they said that it could take at least a year just to get the admin parts of it in place. And then that's not even bringing in the court applications that we've seen various organizations and political parties already queuing pretty much to take government to court on this. So really, I don't think this is something that we are going to see being implemented very soon. And that's a good thing um, because I think it ensures that, you know, whatever NHI plan is put in place will be the best one. I have to say, before you wrap it up, I have to say, mm. Lazan, I've been covering healthcare for a number of years. NHI has been floating around as an idea for, I would say, safely more than 10 years. So I wouldn't hold my breath if I was you. Yeah, so hold on to your medical aid if you have one. Don't give up just yet. The NHI is certainly far, far away. Attention all retirement fund members. From the 1st of September, your retirement savings will be split into two components. Popularly referred to as the two-pot retirement system, it aims to give individuals early access to a portion of the funds they've saved up until now. But consumer beware. Just because you can take the money doesn't mean you should. The next topic I want to get into, and this is one that I've been wanting to discuss on the show for quite some time, and I believe you're the perfect person to help us with this, and it's the two-pot retirement system. It's a term that's been thrown around a lot in the last couple of months as the system is set to come into effect in September this year, but I want you to really break it down for us, what the two-pot system is actually entails. I always like to say that actually it should start out as three pots because that's what you're getting. On the 1st of September this year, you'll have three pots effectively. The first pot is what they call the vested component, which will be all the money that you have saved to date. So your retirement fund savings that you've saved until 1st of September will stay exactly as is. And it still goes towards your retirement and it follows the same rules. Then from the 1st of September going forward, you'll have the famous two pots. One of those will be a savings pot and the other one is your retirement pot. So the retirement pot will be about two thirds roughly of your savings and that's your obligatory. You go for retirement, you cannot touch that money. But the savings pot, which will be the one third, you will be able to withdraw once a year and there's certain restrictions on how much you can withdraw. 
So what they've done is they've said there'll be seed capital on the 1st of September because obviously you'll have to wait to build up money in the savings pot. Yes. And the seed capital will be a minimum of 2,000 rand or 10% of the savings you already have as at 1st of September. So let's say by the 1st of September in your retirement fund, you have 500,000. You'll be able to take out 10% of that 500,000 or a minimum of 2,000 rand. But the 10% is capped at 30,000. So even though you've got 500,000, you can only take out 30,000. And then the money that you withdraw every year from that savings pot will get taxed at your income tax rate, which means if you've got an income tax rate of 40%, I mean... You know, it's it's better to just leave the money in there. Yes, exactly. Because there's a fair amount of confusion around how the system will work. And I think you've really clarified it. But I think a lot of retirement fund members are seeing dollar signs, so to speak, because they're just eager to essentially raid their savings, right? And I think it's important to just kind of remind people that there are limitations. You can't just go on a spending spree, that there are, as you've just said, massive tax implications if you do take the money. So yeah, raiding your savings is probably not the best thing to do right now. But I want to know from you as well, are there any pitfalls around the two-part system? Because I've seen some panic from some people. Other people are welcoming it. They're saying this is long overdue. What has the general take been in your circles and the conversations that you've had? So I think in the retirement funds industry, there is some concern that, like you said, there's going to be a run on on the funds in the sense that people are going to think, oh, this is my chance. I better get out the money now because I have the option. But I think the way to view it is actually if you do that, you're going to be robbing future you. And, you know, if you take out 2,000 rand now and compared to leaving it there, that 2,000 rand would be worth a hell of a lot more by the time you retire. So you're not just stealing 2,000 rand, you're stealing a lot more, which eventually is going to catch up with you. I think the other concerns are that there's still legislation, draft legislation, and regulations which need to be finalized so that exactly all the tiny little details need to be ironed out. And that hasn't happened yet. And that includes important details like if you make these withdrawals, is there going to be a cap on the administration fees that your retirement fund can charge you? Because that will be significant in terms of what are the administration fees? How is it going to work? Does government intend on finalizing that before September or are they kind of dragging their feet in that regard? So two of the laws that they need to finalize will be the draft revenue laws amendment bill and the pension funds amendment bill. And You know, we're four months away from implementation, which is quite worrying because those laws need to be gazetted and then retirement funds still need time to finalize the system and the structures to facilitate withdrawals for the members on their side. You know, there's going to have to be a system for keeping track of in Lausanne's retirement fund. This is how much money she's got available. This is how much she can withdraw each year. And then I've got to give Lausanne a statement showing her these different things. And then there's got to be a facility available for Lizanne to contact her retirement fund and say, okay, I want to withdraw X amount. Like, who do you contact? How do you go about it? Who's going to implement the withdrawal of these funds? There's a lot of details that still need to be figured out. Drones are changing the business world. No longer just a recreational gadget used by avid photographers, videographers and drone racers. Do yourself a favor and look that one up. The humble drone is now becoming far more common in various industries. And with this growing business interest comes a new multi-million dollar enterprise that could feed back into the South African economy. This is an awesome story that you recently wrote for Daily Maverick, and it's not something I've ever really considered. You looked at the economy of drones, so to speak, and how the drone industry in South Africa is quite literally taking off. According to research firm Industry ARC or Industry Arc, the small drone market in South Africa could be worth about $134.5 million by next year. First, I want to know how you came upon this story asking me to give away my secrets, Lizanne. <laughs> but um, 
Actually, I was at a family wedding in the Winelands and it was incredible because we had the usual two photographers on the scene. And then there was this drone hovering above us wow. and it was kind of like wave at the drone now and then the, the drone kind of came right down to the door where the couple were going to walk out and it zoomed in and then as they walked out it kind of pulled back and then there was this aerial shot I'm waiting to see the footage but it did make me curious about how people are using drones for work purposes, which is really fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, when we say drones, a lot of people will immediately think of recreational drones, you know, to take cool photos and videos, as you've just mentioned. But there's another part of the drone industry that's really driving this growth and that you also pointed out in your article, and that's agriculture. Tell me a bit more about that. So the drones actually are able to scan the ground and then if you want to get fertilizer or irrigation even onto your crops, they can calculate and they check out the distance from the ground, even coverage, the correct amount of liquid. And then they provide images, obviously, so you can monitor how that's working. Other industries, you could be in logistics. I mean, Amazon has just landed and there's a likelihood. Maybe one day soon you'll get an Amazon drone arriving at your doorstep. Obviously, full making and search and rescue. I mean, not so long ago, there was a child that was missing in the Saldana Bay area and there was a helicopter that was monitoring the hill not far from where I stay. But that would be much easier and a lot less expensive to do if you had drones to yes. help with search and rescue efforts. And also they're sending drones down into mines and for quarrying. The uses are quite widespread, but as somebody pointed out to me when I was writing the article, at the moment it's more restricted to rural areas because there's less chance of air traffic mm -hmm. and it's less busy. So I think it's a lot it's a lot simpler to operate a drone and make sure it gets to where you need it to be. You can, of course, go check out Nisa's article now on Daily Maverick, where she's also detailed the legislation governing the commercial use of drones, if you're interested in getting into that. But it's a fascinating article to see the benefits of businesses integrating drones into their day-to-day -day running. I just found it fascinating. It's a, an industry that I don't think a lot of us ever consider, really. So that was fascinating. Who remembers the great egg shortage of 2023? We sure do. Now experts and farmers are warning that we could be facing yet another bird flu outbreak should government fail to act decisively. With a push for proper vaccination drives and poultry farmers urging authorities to come up with more practical solutions to curb further outbreaks, it's a race against the clock. Now, the ongoing avian influenza or bird flu outbreak, the outbreak which reached its peak in November last year, has gradually been contained with, I think, only 20 cases of about 80 cases still open in Gauteng. And of those 20, 10 of them are undergoing kind of legal processes. So it's essentially 10 open cases. Now, it's a promising development, but experts have warned that this doesn't necessarily mean the end is in sight, simply that the worst is likely behind us. Where does this leave the poultry industry? Because I know that the outbreak from last year cost the industry billions. Up to 9.5 million chickens had to be culled in the process. Has the industry been able to bounce back? Are they still bouncing back? What is the state of the industry at the moment? So I think the industry has come back from that particular outbreak, but it is concerning. And I don't, I don't know if you remember, but there was a story during the rounds that tinfish has actually become a more popular protein source, yes. I think, due to affordability issues. Mm. And I think this outbreak now is going to push prices up and that's going to increase that scenario where chicken is no longer very cheap. It's not as affordable as it was, say, three years ago. So driven by the novel H7N6 strain, the poultry industry has warned that even though we've just come out of what many have labeled the worst outbreak in South African history, the poultry industry has warned that we could see yet another outbreak, saying there are a number of farms in Gauteng that are refusing to cull their chickens. Of those, are 
the 10 cases that are currently being appealed. But they're essentially saying we refuse to cull our chickens because this particular strain isn't as virulent as the previous one. Again, it feels like we're in a bit of a race against time as farmers push for proper vaccination programs to be introduced as soon as possible. And it feels like government isn't really coming to the table in that regard. I don't know what the outlook is in terms of the poultry industry. Have you had any conversations with industry insiders in terms of how they feel about the next year or so? One of the things with this particular strain, H7N6, is that, yes, it has caused fewer deaths than previous strains of avian flu, which is why the farmers are saying, well, we want an exemption and we don't want to cull. The other factor is that if you cull chickens as a farmer, you're not getting any monetary compensation from the government for that. You know, it's kind of completely your loss. And because this virus is a bit slower, there was a slower reaction from the industry and I assume from government as well, which meant there was more time for feed trucks and people and chickens to get out and spread the disease over much wider geography which is one of the reasons we're in the situation we are now. And I think that's worrying because that really does imply we haven't seen the end of it. Up to 87% of road fatalities can be attributed to road user behavior, with the majority of individuals dying in road accidents being the employed youth aged between 25 and 39. These concerning stats were recently shared at the UN Global Campaign for Road Safety, launched in South Africa. The campaign stretches across 80 countries and aims to make drivers more aware of their bad habits while driving. And before you roll your eyes and reach for your phone, perhaps listen to this first and then think again. So last week, Discovery Insure released its findings on road safety and some of the biggest risks South African drivers face. Unsurprisingly, the one risky driving behavior that really topped the list was the use of cell phones while driving. And I think a lot of us are guilty of that. The report launched at the UN Global Campaign for Road Safety found that a mere 20 seconds on your phone increases your accident risk by more than 60%. That is a shocking statistic. Tell us a little bit more about this report and the five behaviors Discovery highlighted in their findings. So the five behaviors, the first one would be obviously drinking and driving. I have to admit, whenever I take a sip of water while I'm driving, I think, oh, I shouldn't be drinking and driving. But (laughs) And then cell phone use. And then excessive speeding, uh, aggressive driving. South Africans, I think, actually, for some reason, we are quite impatient on the roads. Mm -hmm. And then lack of vehicle care. And lack of vehicle care, I think, is due to people not maintaining their cars. But part of it is because car maintenance and car repairs have become so expensive. At the end of the day, it comes down to the driver, the driver being aware, paying attention while they're driving. I also remember someone saying that people need to be reminded that even when you're at a robot and you think, oh, I'm standing still, let me quickly send that message or check this email. The law says as long as your engine is running, you are technically driving. So therefore, even if you're standing still at a robot, you are still not legally allowed to use your phone in that scenario. Potholes not getting fixed, water infrastructure crumbling, Neighborhoods left to buckle under mountains of waste and very little action from government. But a number of South Africans are saying the time for waiting is over. We'll just fix the country ourselves. And they're doing a pretty fine job of it. Now, the next story you brought is just wonderful. It's titled, Bypassing Government, Gutful South Africans are doing it for themselves. And it sheds light on South Africans who have decided to fix what they can in their areas, whether it's a cleanup campaign or filling potholes, establishing communal vegetable gardens, or even building an entire bridge, which is one of the examples that was highlighted in this article. Communities and individuals across the country are rolling up their sleeves and I just love it. I really, really love it. I I, I have to agree. I absolutely love the story and the fact that there's several different examples really, it's it's such a 
good news story and it gives you such a heartwarming feeling to think that actually you know what this is possible we can do this there there were two things that stood out for me with this story the one was the community that rebuilt the bridge in durban mm-hmm. I was fascinated by the fact that the municipality had estimated the cost of the bridge would be 1.5 to 1.7 million rand and they couldn't say when it could be done and this community got together and with 80,000 rand they managed to do it in a very short space of time which is cool and in terms of our nation and I think Ubuntu and the way we pull together it really is there's no way else in the world that i've seen it other than south africa <laughs> definitely well that's all we have time for today it's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you because really you make it so accessible for our listeners to really understand the bare concepts of some very complex financial issues so thank you very much for bringing those insights and i look forward to our next chat very soon absolute pleasure lazan same here Thanks for listening. Catch us again next week for another whole week wrap. Until then, why not join the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, and everywhere else? We always love hearing from you.